Good evening. It's an honor to be asked to speak at this Global Landscape Forum community, One World, One Health Conference. As the GLF community comes together to think about how to improve the relationship we have with our landscapes and environment. As the current pandemic has taught us, we truly are one world in which the health and well-being of all of us is tightly intertwined. The last century has brought significant changes to how we eat and also what we eat. The good news is that today's food systems can support the nutritional needs of billions globally. Millions have been brought back from the edge of starvation and have also been lifted out of poverty. Intensive production and sophisticated logistics enable foods that are grown halfway across the planet to arrive affordably to our market shelves. Modern science and technology has helped us to produce more food and move it around efficiently. Nevertheless, Many of last century's most pressing challenges in our food systems still persist, and several new challenges are becoming ever more prominent and increasingly urgent. Globally, almost 700 million people go to bed hungry every night, and more than 2 billion are malnourished, which has devastating long-term effects. At the same time, more than 650 million people are obese, and almost 75% of the world's land surface has been substantially degraded, including by intensive agriculture. With a population that will approach 9 billion by 2050, and with more climate stress and higher climate variability on the horizon, the goal of building a more resilient and sustainable food system is more important today than ever before. The good news is that nature has provided us with a key tool to tackle many of our current challenges, the rich biological systems on which we all depend. The diversity inherent in our wildlife, forests and oceans is critical to the resilience of our ecosystems. And today I want to talk briefly about a specific aspect of that diversity, the diversity that underpins the future of our food system that has been created by nature, as well as by people and the agricultural systems that they've created over thousands of years. Among the results are almost 5,000 types of potato, over a thousand varieties of banana, and hundreds of thousands of varieties of rice. Over the millennia, the interactions of people with the plants that are most important to them has given us an astounding range of options to adapt our crops to changes in climate while also addressing the urgent need to provide enough healthy food for everyone. Each of those myriad varieties of food plants holds precious genetic traits that make them unique. Their root systems may enable them to withstand flooding or garner more nutrients. They may have the ability to resist pests, resist droughts, or flourish despite water scarcity. And some may have higher nutritional content. We need to safeguard this diversity if we're to build food systems that can nourish us all sustainably, nutritiously, and forever. Diversity, after all, is life's hedge against extinction. It's the vital resource for allowing us to meet the challenges that our food systems face both now and in the future. Preserving and enabling the use of the diversity of the world's most important crop species is the mission behind the Crop Trust, an organization that was born with the ambitious target to safeguard all of crop diversity forever. This is an essential task for the future of our food, and fortunately, it's a task that's feasible both scientifically and economically. However, as an international community, we're falling short. In Target 2.5 of the Sustainable Development Goals, the global community pledged to safeguard all of crop and livestock diversity 
by the end of 2020, two months from now. And despite much progress in collecting and characterizing crop diversity, and also many successes in ensuring that farmers benefit from crop diversity through breeding programs, it's unfortunately the case that the job is far from done. This issue is at the core of today's conversations, acknowledging that the targets we set a few years ago have not been accomplished and that if we are to eradicate poverty and hunger by 2030, they need immediate reassessment, along with a new joint strategy to increase our efforts to ensure that our goals are achieved. Next year, we will have two critical opportunities to address these challenges the Biodiversity COP in May, and the Food Systems Summit later in the year. At these two global gatherings, we will need to commit to working even harder and under even more challenging conditions to achieve the future of food we all want and that the future generations deserve. This conference gathers some of the world's foremost experts in biodiversity and food systems to think creatively and reimagine our future together, including learning good lessons from the past, such as the value of indigenous plants and cultures, the advantages of local food systems, the benefits that flow from understanding local landscapes and environments, and the importance of a diverse, seasonal, and healthy diet. Diversity is the key and we need to act now so that we can save it and use it, and that will require the commitment of us all. I invite you today to rediscover the power and potential of agrobiodiversity and its importance for the future of all of us. Thank you and be well. Greetings to all participants. I'm delighted to share a message with this important forum on a fundamentally important issue for us all and for all future generations. The topic of today's session is harnessing the power of nature to enhance diversity across food systems. So why is this important? Well, let's be honest. Our global food system is broken. 690 million people go hungry, even before COVID-19. More than 2 billion people don't get enough nutritious food. On top of that, our food production is challenging planetary boundaries. We are depleting the world's water resources, and agriculture contributes roughly to 30% of harmful greenhouse emissions. The world's biological diversity, which, no matter how you look at it, is an important part of the solution, is under siege like never before. According to the latest estimates, one million plant and animal species are facing extinction. We are losing biodiversity and reducing options for the future every day, as we speak, in fact. This is crazy, and it's not impossible nor expensive to do something about it. The power of biodiversity is simply not understood, and particularly not when it comes to agrobiodiversity. The good news is that understanding is increasing, and the focus is greater than it used to be. I am actually pleased that IFAD is under pressure from member states to do more on biodiversity, particularly its use. Biodiversity has huge potential to help us answer questions we need for sustainable food systems. How to increase yields per acre, how to produce food with high nutritional value, how to have more diversity in our diets, and how to adopt more sustainable production using less water, less fertilizer, and less pesticides. This is why it is so urgent to safeguard and better use biodiversity, 
in gene banks and in the field. And we know we can. Beans with higher iron content, sweet potatoes with higher vitamin A content, more drought resistant wheat and rice have all been developed, just to mention a few. And we can develop these plants with natural breeding, provided we have access to the greatest possible amount of diversity. And that we put science, as well as farmers, to work. In so many ways, farmers can champion new and better use of biodiversity. Agriculture is a lifeline for two and a half billion people who live on 500 million small-scale producing farms. 63% of whom live in poverty. These smallholders, many of whom are indigenous peoples, are custodians of biodiversity and ecosystems. Small-scale farmers, through their work and cultures, are intimately connected to the natural environment and how it is used. This is why their involvement is central to identifying solutions to biodiversity loss, environmental degradation and climate change, both at local and global levels. But they also need new tools, additional knowledge and not the least finance to contribute to the new resilient food system that the world desperately needs. And to do it in a way that supports their livelihoods. With EFAD's mandate to improve the livelihoods and well-being of rural smallholders, we are uniquely positioned to promote innovative approaches in our projects for sustainable production and food systems across rural landscapes. But we can't do it alone. We need partners. The Food Systems Summit that the UN Secretary General has taken the initiative to host next September is a great opportunity to build the partnerships that are required to put our food systems on a resilient footing. IFAD is delighted to be the UN anchor agency for the summit's action track on equitable livelihoods. We will use our position in the summit to ensure the livelihoods of rural small-scale farmers do not become forgotten and come as an afterthought when we talk about transforming food systems. Without transforming their livelihoods, our food systems will continue to stay broken and we will not be able to protect nor harness the biodiversity in the vulnerable landscapes they inhabit. Biodiversity is also important for all other action tracks. I indeed hope and invite all good partners to come together to make sure we use, make good use of the opportunity of the Food System Summit to raise awareness about the fundamental importance of biodiversity, particularly agrobiodiversity, and that we get it sufficiently high on the agenda for concrete decisions to be made for actions to safeguard and use biodiversity as an important means for future resilient food systems. The need to do so has never been clearer. So to conclude, action is urgently needed and none of us can do it alone. This is an invitation to work together. I hope we are all up to the task. Thank you so much for joining today's conversation and I wish you an engaging session. Haga and Sir Peter Crane for not only setting the stage for this panel, but reminding all of us that safeguarding biodiversity is both dependent on farmers and all of us as eaters, and that we need new strategies and new investment 
but also learning from the past. We have a fantastic group of speakers and I won't take time to introduce them all, but uh, Kent, Susan Mildred, and Pablo are all here to share their thoughts with us on how we can move forward, how we can really pave the way forward for sustainable uh, development goal 2.5 post 2020. Um, so I just wanna dive right in. We have a, a short amount of time to, to talk to all of you. Uh, SDG 2.5 is a huge goal and unfortunately it hasn't fully been achieved. So my first question to all of you and maybe take 30 seconds for you each to answer is how far along are we and where do we need to go? Again, be succinct, tell us where, you're, where you think we're at and achieving this goal and what needs to be done uh, you know, over the next year, five years, 10 years to really get to the, uh, the achievement of it. Susan, why don't you go first? Sure, yes. I think it, it, the, for me, the most important thing is to see the SDGs as interconnected. And particularly, you can even just look at SDG and look at its targets. So SDG 2.5, which we're talking about, is really about genetic diversity. And we look at that as a source of traits. It's very important. But international law defines agricultural bio biological diversity much more broadly. It defines it at the species and the ecosystem. You know, so it's not just the genetic level. And I think it's really important that we make that connection. And, and in that way, we also connect sort of ex situ collections with what's happening in farmers' fields and see these as sure. things, both things that need to be supported as complementary strategies. And the evolution Perfect. of these resources in the field is really important. Yeah, I want to come back to that issue of interconnectedness with you in a few minutes. Uh, Pablo, why don't you go next? Pablo, I believe you're on mute. We can't hear you. I'm just going to, you got it? Uh, yes, uh, biodiversity is uh, a, a key in, in many, many crops, you know, and and. and most familiar with coffee and cocoa, for instance, and in both of, both of them, biodiversity plays a huge role. Uh, it also plays a social role because, you know, some of the most uh, traditional uh, uh, crop, cropping or cultural uh, practices for growing these, these items uh, have to do with growing different products in a biodiverse environment. And uh, Absolutely. what we're seeing right now is that the world is paying attention to it. For instance, there is a coffee certification for for uh, bird-friendly uh, bird uh, grown Absolutely. coffee by the Smithsonian uh, Institution. So uh, we're starting to recognize that some of these traditional practices protect the biodiversity of our crops. Right, right. that awareness is definitely growing. Kent, uh, why don't you go next? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dana. My, uh, well, 2020 was supposed to be the super year for biodiversity. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, unfortunately, yes, uh, yeah, but the, the COVID came, it disrupted things, but also highlights the actually the, the issues we're talking about that we ignore the warning signals at our own peril and also emphasizes the fact that uh, global issues, global problems relating to biodiversity need to be dealt with you know, by international cooperation, by multilateral approaches, which is, you know, so, so critical. Uh, and and um, the other aspect, of course, the, the original uh, uh, global framework for biodiversity, which was the IG targets, uh, and which was borrowed by the SDG 2.5, focused only on conservation. But agrobiodiversity, by definition, implies use of biodiversity. Uh, sure. th that use aspect was not captured in that, and I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, going forward. Absolutely. And let's talk about that in a minute, conservation versus use or utilization. Mildred, I'm so glad you were able to join us, come back and join us. So what, what are your thoughts on, on how far we are in SDG 2.5 and, and where do we need to go? And again, just take a, you know, 30 seconds or so to sort of give us your perspective. Uh, 
Uh, Mildred, I think you're on mute or maybe you're stuck. That's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so Susan, we talked about interconnectedness before, right? And you know, this is one thing that's always puzzled me about the SDGs is there's, you know, there's a lot of them, a lot of regular people don't understand them and they don't understand how they're connected. How can we do better over the next, you know, in the lead up to the Food System Summit to explain that interconnectedness? Yeah, I think it's 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 a challenge because it, it, it's always easier, I think, for the human brain to, to disaggregate and solve for problems separately. But if we don't look at the unintended consequences and, and we solve for a problem that is actually a complex problem, you know, mm -hmm. we get fertilizer because the soil is 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 depleted as opposed to what 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 got it depleted in the first place. So I do think there's an educational component, but I also think there's an issue with power relations and you know who's being served by for me, I'm a lawyer served by particular public <laughs> right. policy. And that we really have to look at that. And, and I would say we really have to look at that in terms of even how this food summit is being organized when we have a committee on world food security. Um, so, Absolutely. I mean, I'm can quite- you, Can you I dig just, a I, little bit deeper into that? Because I, I know there's been some controversy. A lot of folks are concerned. Yeah, well, I, I very much welcome that we're talking about food systems, because I think we have to talk about the system, because again, all these things are interconnected. But it's not just that we talk about food systems, it's about who, where, with whom are we talking, and how are we talking? That is as, as, as important that, that we're talking about as a system, if we're not having the right actors at the table. And right now, the, the organization of the Food Summit has been pretty opaque. We have a, an established you know, structure the Committee on World Food Security, which has been reformed and is more democratic. And it, it, it and there have been, you know, I think 400 or so civil society organizations that have sent a letter asking about to get more transparency. Absolutely. I think we really have to ask those questions because that's where we get into the power issues. Are we going to ignore things that we know work? Are the people at the table that know, you know, have good ideas about yeah. how we need to do Are they going to be there? Absolutely. Uh, and I, I wish Mil I, I hope Mildred can come back and join us because I know her focus is really on youth and their voices are so needed at, at the at the the summit. So I, I hope we can get into that later. Pablo, you you've talked a lot about how with how coffee production in general has a, a, a huge impact on smallholder farmers. And you've said that when the coffee industry is doing well, a lot of people are doing well. And, and when coffee is grown sustainably, there's a huge multiplier effect. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about that in terms of how we, you know, again, going back to this idea of paving the way forward for SDG 2.5, how does that relate? What is that multiplier effect? How does that enhance the, the, yes. the sustainable development goal? Uh, thank you, Daniel. And uh, I also want to refer to, to the previous question because uh, I, I believe that we can get some market mechanisms to work for some of these crops, like coffee, for instance. Now, I was talking about one particular uh, certification, but there's, you know, organic coffee certification, carbon mm -hmm. neutral certification. Carbon neutral is very nice because when you measure your carbon footprint and you start to minimize that carbon footprint, you have to do a lot of other things. You have to protect the species. You have to... Uh, um, uh, um, uh, reduce all the fertilizer and the, all the chemicals that will go into the soil. Uh, you have also like the Rainforest Alliance certification, so fair trade certification. All of these certifications are ways to get closer to the end consumer because mm -hmm. if we drink coffee every day and we know where that co that coffee comes from and how it was it was uh, produced, and we become more responsible all the value chain will benefit. And when I say all the value chain, it starts with the small farmers because uh, coffee is dominated worldwide. You know, it's, it's worldwide grown in developing countries and it's dominated by small and medium-sized farmers, you know, and many of them are households led by women, more than 30% of them, for instance. So, it's uh, it, 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 that's the multiplier effect I was I was talking sure. about because if we do something in this case for coffee, we're doing something that could benefit a lot of uh, rural communities in developing countries, many of them led by women 
or by uh, small growers associations. And, sure. uh, and another, I want to mention another of those market mechanisms that could help, which is a lot of these coffee regions are beautiful regions, are regions where you go just to, just to, to, to see the sites and talk to the people and live the culture. But it also happens that many of these communities are nearby tourism hotspots. You know, sure. and I always use the example of a, a, we, we, we buy coffee in Peru uh, from farmers that are 10 kilometers away from Machu Picchu. And we have over a million tourists going to Machu Picchu every year. Well, except this one because of the pandemic, but uh, over a, a million, uh, 1.2 million tourists going to Machu Picchu. And none of them know that 10 kilometers away, uh, people grow coffee. And these sure, are beautiful, sure. beautiful, beautiful uh, lands. And, uh, and when you get that chance to get involved uh, with the people and with the, and, and you know, right. here, here in Costa Rica, I'm in Costa Rica, and tourists come here and they don't know where coffee comes right. from. And it's a missed opportunity. Them, it's, a, it's an opportunity. So we, these are right. market mechanisms that makes us all more responsible so that when we drink coffee right. every day, we think of how to be more responsible. Kent, you know, Pablo's been talking a lot about farmers, especially uh, women farmers. And when we're talking about conserving biodiversity, we often forget that farmers have to do that and they also have to make money. And, and, and so I'm hoping you can sort of reconcile this, this idea of, of uh, conservation versus utilization. How can we do both effectively? Yeah, indeed, uh, as I mentioned before, I mean, agrobiodiversity by definition implies use of biodiversity, whether for food, feed, fiber, or for industrial purposes. So effectively, you know, we'll, to be able to use uh, biodiversity for agriculture, I mean, to conserve it, but you, you, you still need, need, need to use it. Uh, and, and secondly, agriculture, as you, as you all know, is the largest user of biodiversity by sector. And at the same time, it, makes, it has the largest and the greatest impact on biodiversity at the same time. So previous you know, initiatives have not taken into account that use aspect of biodiversity. Uh, and if you look at the previous uh, global framework, which was the IH targets, uh, there was mm -hmm. a focus on conservation, which was, as I said, bro, bro, you know, you know, transferred into uh, the SDGs. Uh, so the, the essence of um, not taking into account the fact that biodiversity is the basis of our food security. And that food security is based on use of biodiversity. Uh, it was not a, an objective that was recognized in the previous framework. And then you, that needs to be taken into account going, to going forward. And conservation is not conservation for the sake of conservation itself. We can only conserve right. through use. Yes, and use, you know, and, and um, conserve, conserve for use as well. Once we're in the, I mean, considering that we're in the agriculture sector, and farmers are the best practitioners of that, you know, ethos of conserving through use, because by the fact that they use it, it gives it value. They recognize the use uh, that it's valuable for them, and they conserve it for that purpose. And then, you know, Absolutely. the fact that they're also able to, you know, um, to to um, uh, that use, of course, uh, you know, multiplied into using as a basis for developing further varieties and 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 um, and species that uh, uh, address uh, other needs, including uh, climate and environmental changes that we're experiencing currently. Absolutely. So, Susan, you know, as a lawyer, as somebody who's looking at, you know, the structures and mechanisms that will protect farmers and protect biodiversity what's needed? I mean, we have an international framework that is, is supposed to protect farmers, but is it doing that? No, and I would, I would want to move away from the idea of protecting farmers. Farmers are agents of change. They're innovative populations of them, themselves. And I also Absolutely. think we have to be really clear that when we're talking about food, we're talking about, it becomes complicated because it's both considered a commodity and it's a human right. So when we talk about coffee, we're having a different conversation, though it, there's things that are relevant than when we're talking about food. Though I still think, you know, there are lots of rules that can be used that, that like bird friendly, but I think that we have to make distinctions when we're talking about uh, coffee or horticulture versus, you know, mm. crops that, that people mm -hmm, eat. Mm -hmm, and I, mm -hmm. I think our problem is, is, again, that there's been a lot of focus, I think, on market-based approaches. And again, there can be a role for the market 
but markets are regulated. And right now, public policy and market incentives in general have encouraged the production of uniform commodity crops. And that has displaced small scale farmers on Absolutely. farms. It is eroding agricultural biological diversity. So I think we have to have very tough conversations about what, what do we think markets can do? What, how should they be regulated? What markets shouldn't be allocating? What should our governments be doing? You know, and, and again, democratically accountable spaces. Um, so those Absolutely. are, it's not enough just to be pulling in with your Prius into a farmer's market. <laughs> I think we're good, right? It, it, we're in a, in a globalized system and that has an impact on what smallholder farmers can plant and how they plant it. And, and well, you, go, sorry, please finish. No, 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 go ahead. Yes, I think we have to ask our que questions about what do we subsidize? What do we not subsidize? Where do R&D dollars go? We know there's more and more evidence about the value of agroecological approaches. And there, you know, that's the word that's used in the Committee on Food Security, regenerative, there are lots of, but there's, that's been around since the 1920s, growing evidence yeah. about that. But if you look at R&D dollars towards that, very low percentage. Absolutely. Of. And if you want to go back, I mean, regenerative if I can come farming in back. Has, okay. Sure, go ahead. No, no, yeah, I was going to talk about the, the, the issue of, uh, Susan raised a very good point about market, uh, the role in market, uh, there's certainly a huge market failure when it comes to conserving diversity in, in agriculture, you know, it is not the actual, the, you know, the appropriate instrument or mechanism for, for the purpose of conserving biodiversity. Diversity in agriculture and agrobiodiversity is a global public good that needs different mechanism and approach to do so. So it's not the markets that can control that essentially because of the incentive measures, the subsidies that are involved, as well as the, the general dynamics of, of the global you know, uh, trade uh, processes that um, you know, encourage different processes that do not encourage uh, um, the, you know, protection and conservation of, of diversity. No, and I think Pablo, add, any thoughts? Please, please add Pablo. Yes, I, I'd like to add you know, a, a different uh, perspective to this because I, I know there's a role in government and, and, there's, and there's a role in the markets. And I think we can do both. We can do more of both because we can uh, try to, for instance, the carbon markets, the carbon markets have that type of mix. You know, you have to regulate and then you, you, you place uh, emissions squad, the governments place emissions quotas, and, but then you create this market for carbon bonds and then there's some market mechanisms around it. So we have to work Around around those types of incentives, uh, and and I I'll, I know coffee is different from other crops, but I'll go back to coffee, you know, and uh, and 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 I always recommend you know to the small growers, you know, get away from the commodity side of the business, do something different, something special, sure. something that you can show to people, and and let's try to well, we're, again, I'm biased because I'm in Costa Rica, so we have tourists all over the place, but when those tourists go to those small farms. And see these uh, the, these farmers working and, and and all the work that has that that goes into coffee and all the things they do to protect the environment and they, and they see the birds and they see the mammals sure. and they see the, the the forest the shade you know shade grown coffee is another certification okay they see all of this and they, they get in love with the situation and they're absolutely then they're willing to pay for it because that's absolutely. You know, the market mechanism that I'm referring to. So I think we need a little bit of both or a lot of both. Sure, sure. Mildred, it's so nice to see you back. I hope you can hear me. Um, I want you, you know, we were talking about people who are missing in this conversation often and, and one group is youth. And I'm hoping you can talk about your work with youth in Jamaica and how, you know, they're not only protecting biodiversity, uh, you know, and, and making it available to schools and their communities, but how they're often left out of these conversations, global conversations around the future of agrobiodiversity and what should be done. So I, I because we haven't, you know, had a chance to hear from you, please take a, a few minutes to talk about your work and how we can encourage that more youth are heard. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that we have to think seriously about um, succession planning. And of course, our youth plays a critical role in that area because when we think about retiring, then that button has to be passed on. 
and we have to make sure that we pass on the information that the, the, the history or the legacy continues. Of course, I think that um, emphasis needs to be placed on digital technology in, in agriculture, for especially for developing countries like the Caribbean, as a key transformation vehicle to enhance trade, food production, and processing, and to build robust and resilient food systems. Digital technology method um, can close many gaps and man as it manifests itself in the lives of small farmers. And we have to look at schools in the category of small farmers. They have these tutorial farms, but they make a big difference in the lives of communities and even larger areas that you would call um, districts. Um, it also um, lends an understanding or an here to the situation that exists in most of these underdeveloped or developing countries where only 2% of the budget or the, the, the national budget goes to agriculture. And so agriculture carries a burden of, of, of discrimination in these areas Absolutely. where they are always left behind and seen as... Um, uh, uh, and a sector that it's the less fortunate who do this work. However, when it comes to feeding household, agriculture is seen as the rescue agent. In, based on all of this, I, I believe that, um, and it has been proven, that we have to ensure that the culture of biodiversity is cemented in the minds and is practiced from the start and that is in the schools so that when these career these people come and take up their careers or they are agro entrepreneurs they will be ready they will be they will be well carved to fit into where we have left off and to even build better using the digital technology so well yeah, said and i, and I Please go ahead, Kent. Sorry, if I jump in there, yeah. just two seconds. Please. Sorry. Yeah, I think there's also a moral argument to be made in, the, in this sense, because at the end of the day, it's the youth and the future generation that will have to suffer the consequences of our profile gacy and our, and, and our, 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 our you know, failures and, and omissions. In, in that sense, they, they ought to be part of the conversation now, to be, to be inclu included in, in the processes and the, the, the should be taken into account. And, 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 and may I add that? Please. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, I, may I add that uh, this court of, um, of people, young people, are very innovative and, and, very, and, and they, can, they can do a lot to make a lot of changes in even some of the policies that, we, that our governments make. So I think this target group needs, this court of people needs to be trained and, and, and trained and trained. And we need, to, we need to accept them, give them that kind of acceptance that they feel wanted in this area. And when they feel loved, they will stay. I love that. I love that. And I love that you said the culture of biodiversity. I think having the culture put back in agriculture. Pablo, please go. No, I'd like to just uh, reinforce what, what uh, Mildred and Kent uh, are, are talking about because it's, uh, it, you know, the, the, the most beautiful schools that I've seen are in very remote rural areas, you know, schools where you see uh, the, all the, all the, um, the uh, environmental practices in place, you know, doing all the recycling, having their vegetables produced there, having, you know, in, in the schools by the, by the children. And, the, and, and from my experience in Latin America, that is a lot easier to do in rural areas. And, mm. and we, we have to do that, that but, 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 but where the real challenge is in the cities, you know, our cities are not as environmental as they should be. So sure. I think that we think of a public policy Okay, that's great because because we uh, adults who maybe did not have that type of education when we were kids, the, the younger generations actually require that from us, you know, and, 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 and 
it's happened in my case, in my personal case with my children, you know, they, they, they went to school, they, they received their environmental education, and then they came home and required us to implement those practices at home. Sure. So that's good. You know, I, 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 sure. Susan, please. Your challenge in cities that in rural areas. Susan, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think just reinforcing that, I think the important thing is that rural life has to be attractive. It can't be something to do this, I'm going to be poor and hungry. It has to be attractive. And there may be some market solutions to make it attractive, but uh, there also needs to be public policy to make it attractive. That, you know, if we think agrobiodiversity and the innovative, uh, activities of smallholder farmers are producing something that's important to us to achieve the agenda 2030, to achieve the sustainable development goals, then we need to provide public support for that. We need it to be attractive. And in that way, it would, would help us with, you know, this urbanization and, and, and the poverty in cities. And we, mm -hmm. we can't ask people to do something that's not attractive. And it certainly is not going to be attractive to youth, you know, if it means I'm going to be poor and hungry. Really, rural areas need to be stimulating, really interesting, fun places to live where people want to be there and not, not feel forced to be there. Before we turn to questions from the audience, uh, one thing that I've been worried about, I mean, obviously COVID-19 presents so many challenges, but one thing that I've heard from talking to chefs and scientists is that because, you know, the the uh, closure of so many restaurants and schools and, and other institutions around the world, that the demand for biodiverse products from farmers is, is diminishing. And, you know, farmers who were growing for whether it was high-end restaurants or um, other, you know, institutions, they're, they're, you know, they're losing a big market. Are you worried that COVID-19 is going to have a big impact on what farmers are growing in terms of, of biodiversity? I, if you could each just take a, a few seconds to answer so that I can get to at least one question from the audience, we're running over. Well, I, could, I would say that that's a pretty narrow question because again, you're looking at, at the connection between a chef and a farming community. Well, and that but it's, it's, it's institutions, institutions who procured from farmers, whether it's schools yeah. or hospitals or others. I agree. I mean, what I'm, I, but I always worry a little bit when we try to put the, um, the solution all on a consumer when it, I, I think it's the, the consumer's choice is, you know, it's it, policies are influencing what choice exists. And COVID-19, I think, has definitely exposed vulnerabilities and where there was this kind of relationship and procurement, I think you know, that's that's something we have to look at. But what I, we've seen is there's more resilience in these shorter chains where there's, you know, that, that where there's your a reliance on the local food system and those connections that that's where the resilience is. And the longer yeah. the chain, the more vulnerable one becomes. And so, yeah, very important, I think, to be able to have public procurement policies and to have those continue to support smallholder farmers, to support diverse sure. nutrient dense foods. Um, but, and I do think COVID-19 has also just exposed the interconnections. I mean, the fact that we have people more vulnerable to it is because they're, they have you know, non-communicable diseases, which are related to what they eat because we're not producing Absolutely. healthy food. So in, uh, my hope is COVID-19 is some ways can catalyze us to see the connections between health and nutrition and diversity and climate change and, and that pandemics are more likely because of biodiversity loss, because of habitat destruction. These things all go together. And that's how right. I'm hoping we will learn that we need to be figuring out how to work together to solve problems. Absolutely. So uh, I want to get to this question uh, from the audience. Pablo, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you. I want to at least one audience question. So um, the the uh, listener asks, most farmers are rural people who depend greatly on using biodiversity. How can we encourage participatory management for agrobiodiversity? Are there experiences that you can each share? Uh, indeed. Can yes. You? In fact, if I can. Yeah, my intervention was uh, essentially also partially in response to this question. I was following up from what Susan said that, uh, of course, <laughs> undeniably, the, the, the impact of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic was significant and, and you know, devastating in a lot of cases. But at the same time, there were a few you know, you know, positive there, which includes the fact that uh, for a lot of uh, farmers, especially those who were just getting into the planting season when the pandemic broke out, you know, because they couldn't access immediately the market they would, you know, which is the easy option, go to the market to get 
seeds they need for planting. Mm -hmm. Now we have to resort to some of the uh, diversity that had conserved for different purposes. And uh, those are the, usually the local, you know, well-adapted varieties that they've used. And they you know, resort to it, or also going to their neighboring farmers to get the seeds for, for cultivation and then using those local varieties. To that extent, uh, it had helped you know, to conserve and continuously use use that uh, as well. But it also exposes the vulnerability that we we'll have when you have long you know, supply chains that are there, that's the shorter the chain, the, the, the more advantageous it, 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 it is. And that uh, you know, goes to support the argument that local seed systems should be you know, really enforced, reinforced and supported. You know, either by you know, con you know, supporting you know, local seed banks or, or seed conservation systems, uh, uh, as it were. Mildred, I'd like to give you the final word like about these participants, please. I want to share a Jamaican experience and, and also I want to define um, the role of farmer in our own context. It is the duty of the farmer or the primary producer to cater for the very sophisticated diets that really exist all around. And um, COVID taught us a lot of things. In Jamaica, we didn't have a food shortage. And while the hotels went down, the government of Jamaica pumped um, some stimulus packages in. So the farmers were cushioned, the cost was, put, um, was cushioned there. And the, the cost of food became less and all the persons in small household or who make up small household families were able to buy food at a very low cost sure so you find that the distribution of the food went around to the household we didn't waste anything and we didn't lose anything so um, and we continue to have that kind of system here just now in Jamaica. So we are happy with it and we, um, we are hoping that it will last and um, our farmers are not complaining because we still have circulation of our economic status is still average. Might not be the large, the highest, but we are on average right now. And I really think the world has a lot to learn from what Jamaica is doing. I'm so sorry, we have to end. This has been a really invigorating conversation. There's too much to talk about. You are all amazing. Thank you, Susan, Pablo, Mildred, and Kent. Um, and I look forward to hearing more from you uh, over the next several months as we gear up for the UN Food Systems Summit. Uh, and thanks to all of our listeners and viewers. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, thank you very Bye, much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.